Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we continue our journey through uh, the Gospel of Mark. And so I want to invite you, if you would, to go ahead and pull out your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 13. We will be covering that whole chapter of Mark together this morning. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to use one of the Bibles provided in the seat backs in front of you. And on those Bibles, you'll find this morning's passage on page 849. Page 849, if that helps you to get there more quickly. Now, as you're turning to Mark 13, let me set up today's reading this way. As you know, if you've been here for the last several weeks, Jesus has been teaching, and he's been teaching in a certain setting. He's been teaching for, for this whole past chapter. He's been teaching in the temple precincts. And often in that teaching, he has been challenging the religious authorities, those that are sort of in charge of the temple, as it were. This week in Mark 13, Jesus will predict the complete destruction of the temple. And not only that, Jesus is going to predict the end of the world. Let's take a look at this important chapter together. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, follow along as I read it straight through. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Be on your guard, for, there will, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will be delivered by brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose... He shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds with great power and glory and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning the day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is God's word. You know, expectations in life are very important, aren't they? Expectations are important. Have you ever set your expectations too low? Like maybe you're a college student and you took that certain class because everybody told you it would be an easy A and you set those expectations low. But now you're sitting in class and they hand out the syllabus and you have syllabus shock. Because this is actually going to be a really hard class. You set your expectations too low. Maybe have you had the experience of setting your expectations too high? Maybe you superloaded your expectations in a friendship or a relationship, and your standards for that person were so high that they couldn't help but eventually disappoint you. Sometimes our expectations are too low. Sometimes our expectations are too high. Life is a game of expectations. Would you agree? The trick is to align your expectations with how things really will be out into the future. In other words, the trick is to have realistic expectations. You say, why are you bringing up this topic of expectations this morning, Pastor Eric? Well, here's why. Because in our passage here in Mark 13, Jesus is going to reset his disciples' expectations about how the world should be in the lead-up to his return. He wants to give them an expectations reset, as it were. Now, the setting for all of this is the temple in Jerusalem. It's King Herod the Great's temple in Jerusalem. This temple was a wonder of the ancient world. King Herod had been working on it for over 50 years by the time Jesus speaks in our passage. Here's a picture of that temple. It's actually a scale model, kind of gives you a sense for its grandeur. The temple and the precinct around it measured 500 meters long, 325 meters wide. It covered 35 acres of, gr of ground, the equivalent of 12 football fields. It was enormous. It was beautiful. It was a marvel to behold. It was built of massive stones. In fact, today in Israel, you can go on a tour where you get to see some of the foundation of this temple. Uh, still there to this day. And it is made up of these enormous stones that you can look at, uh, one of which is 42 feet long, 11 feet high, 14 feet deep, weighing over a million pounds. Amazing, isn't it? So the Temple Mount, can, can, together with the temple itself, made this temple the, temp the largest temple in the ancient world. So it's no wonder that the disciples that day were very proud of this temple as they marveled looking at it. And one of them said, look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And true to form, Jesus replies by saying something absolutely shocking. Verse 2, and Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Make no mistake, in this verse, Jesus predicts the total destruction of Herod's temple. Now, this would be absolutely unthinkable to the disciples as they are sitting there that day hearing Jesus say these words. But as you know, in the year 70 AD, Jesus' words would be exactly fulfilled 
as the Roman emperor, Titus, sacks the city and levels the temple to the ground. Listen to how the ancient historian Josephus, listen to how he describes this event. He says, quote, Caesar ordered the whole city and the temple to be raised to the ground. All the rest of the wall encompassing the city was so completely leveled to the ground as to leave future visitors to the spot no ground for believing that it had ever been inhabited. So the unthinkable would, in fact, happen. The temple would be leveled, just as Jesus predicted. But listen, for the disciples that day, Jesus' prediction, as we said, was extraordinary. It was unthinkable. It was mind-boggling. And so they had some questions. And so they head down from the Temple Mount, across the Kidron Valley, up to the Mount of Olives, where they sit down with a crystal-clear view of the temple. And Peter, Andrew, James, and John privately ask Jesus a question. Verse 4. They say, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Notice carefully what the disciples are asking. This is important, okay? On the one hand, they are asking Jesus, when will the temple be destroyed? You just predicted that a moment ago. So, so when's this going to happen? When's the temple going to be destroyed? And what sign can we look for that it's about to happen? On the other hand, I want you to see and I want you to realize that in the disciples' worldview, they would have coupled together in their mind's eye the idea of the temple being destroyed with the final judgment of God. The temple's destruction, they would equate that with the final day. So essentially, what they're also asking Jesus is not just about the de de destruction of the temple per se. No, they're asking Jesus, when's the end of the world? <laughs> when's the end of the world? And what signs can you tell us that we can look for that it's right up on us? And so in light of all this, Jesus, as I said, wants to adjust their expectations. Jesus wants to adjust the disciples' expectations about how history will unfold until the end so that they will live faithfully until the end. And there's a lesson there for us too, brothers and sisters. I wonder for you, as you think about it, what do you expect the world to be like until Jesus returns? How do you expect history to unfold until that final day? What do you think that disciples are going to go through? What do you expect disciples to go through before the end is, is finally here? Well, here's the main idea for this morning. Here's the big point of all points that I want you to wrap your mind around it. And this, it is this. We Christians must align our expectations with Jesus' predictions so we can live faithfully to the end. I'm going to say that again. We must align our expectations with Jesus' predictions so that we can live faithfully until the very end. And Jesus tells us that we should expect five things before the end is here. We should expect five things before the end is here. Let's go through all five. First, we should expect imposters. We should, inspect, we should expect imposters. Look there at verse 5. Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. Jump over, if you would, to verse 21. Notice he says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. So in those verses, Jesus says, look, guys, there's going to be imposters. There's going to be counterfeit messiahs and false prophets that claim to speak for God. They will even work miracles. They will try to lead God's people, the elect, astray. I'm telling you now, don't be surprised by it. Be on the lookout. Expect it, he says. And Jesus' prediction about these imposters 
That came true in the first century world where you had many false messianic movements that led many people astray. You had false prophets trying to tempt the church with false teaching. And Jesus' predictions have come true down through the ages, haven't they? As Christ counterfeits have tempted God's people in every generation, including ours. Now, here's the thing. An imposter is so tricky because it looks like the real thing, right? My kids and I like to watch this reality TV show called Is It Cake? Is it cake? The contestants in the show have to look at several objects up on the stage and decide whether these items are real items or whether they are actually cakes. They're made out of cake. And they have to guess. And so that stuff might look like a real boot or a real toaster oven or a real basketball, but it might, in fact, be made out of cake. So if you see the show, everybody, all the contestants, they have to make their guesses, which one's cake, which one's not cake. And then the host comes up with this big, long knife and takes the knife and goes up to each object and he says, is it cake? And begins to cut in. And if he can't cut it, maybe it's a real basketball. But if he starts to slice it, you're like, oh, no, it's cake. Here's the thing with this show. My kids, they always guess correctly. They always get it right. I never get it right. I can't figure out if it's cake. Why? Well, maybe I don't have the right glasses on, or maybe it's because counterfeits look like the real thing, don't they? And Jesus is saying, we should expect Christ counterfeits that look like real Christianity, but they're not. And yet I think you'd agree that many people are not expecting counterfeits in the church. That's not their expectation. And so when they encounter it, their faith is rattled by it. And so you see this all the time. Someone has been burned by an unhealthy church. Someone has been manipulated by some pastor somewhere. Someone has been tragically misled or even abused by a so-called Christian or so-called ministry. And these things have soured their respect for the church. And these things have made them cynical about the church. And so because that horrible situation happened to them, they're now deconstructing their entire Christian faith. And they're maybe even considering walking away entirely from Christianity altogether. Now look, friend, if that's you this morning and you're, you're in this place and you've gone through some levels of that kind of dysfunction that I'm talking about, that hurt and that pain in the church, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. It's not right. But listen, if that's you, please do not walk away from the real Jesus because you were wounded by a Jesus counterfeit. Please don't reject the true church because you were hurt by a false church. Please don't deconstruct the true Christian faith because you were wounded by a false prophet. No, Jesus warns us here that imposters will actually be the norm. Counterfeits will be the norm. Be on guard against them, he says. And when you've been wounded by them, run back to the true Jesus. Run back to the true gospel. Run back to the true people of God. Jesus says, expect imposters. That's number one. Secondly, Jesus says, expect political and natural disasters. Political and natural disasters. Look again at verse 7. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Would you think with me for just a moment about the mindset of the earliest Christians as they would hear and read Jesus' words? If you think about it, they had no idea how long history would continue before Christ's return. For all they knew, he was going to return soon, very soon. And so when these early Christians experienced things like war, when they experienced things like famine, when they experienced things like earthquakes, it would be so natural for them to think, well, the end of the world is here. 
And in fact, we know in the first century world, there were war, there was war, there was earthquakes, famines, all of these things. They actually experienced them. And they would naturally click in the thought, we've reached the end, end of the world is here. You know, we do the same thing in our modern world. We encounter these kinds of troubles and we tend to think it's the end of the world. Who could forget the year 2020? Let me remind you. <laughs> COVID hits. There's all these lockdowns. Inflation soars. The shelves become empty. There's riots following George Floyd's tragedy. And if all that weren't bad enough, Mel Lemon catches on fire. <laughs> and I just remember sitting there thinking, like many of you, like, this must be the end. Let's preach revelation, right? Like, and I did. Uh, but <laughs> we're thinking, those events, they just click into our mind. This is it. But he, Jesus here says, no, when you see political disasters and natural disasters, it's not necessarily a sign that the end is already here, but it is a sign that the end is on its way. The end is coming soon. And Jesus uses the perfect example to illustrate this there in verse 8. Notice, look at verse 8. He says, these are but the beginning of the birth pains. The beginning of the birth pains. We're to look at political and natural disasters as birth pains. Well, I'm the father of five children, and I was there for each of their birth. But you can rest assured I'm not going to take credit for any of their births. My wife's one of those crazy people who went all natural. And so I am here to tell you, labor pains and the labor process looks painful. Now, there was one time, just one time, where I tried to equate my pain with kidney stones to what it's like to give birth to a baby, and I was swiftly rebuked by Abby and every other woman on the planet, and I understand that now. But the point remains, the labor process, birth pains, contractions, they're very painful. And yet each painful contraction is also an experience of tremendous joy. Because with each contraction, you have the thought that beautiful baby is on the way. It's pain and hope mixed together. In the same way, Jesus said, we should expect that political and natural disasters in the times between his first coming and his second coming are going to be like labor pains, like birth pains, because these events are painful. These events are tragic. These events are hard. But at the same time, these disasters are also a sign of hope. They're a sign of hope that a new world is coming, and it is coming with King Jesus. He's going to fix it. He's going to make all things new. And we have to get our expectations right. See, many Christians turn on the TV and they see dev the devastation of war and it is tragic. And they see political chaos and they see the tragedy of natural disasters and there's so much pain there. And they watch that and they think to themselves, how could God allow that? And they become disillusioned. And their faith wavers. But we need to see here that Jesus says, no, don't be disillusioned by these things. Expect these things. God has sovereignly allowed, God has sovereignly ordained such tragedies to continue all the way until Christ returns. He's allowed them for reasons that only God knows. Nonetheless, in the meantime, we should see every war, we should see every global disruption, we should see every earthquake, every tsunami, every famine as a sign, as a reminder that the new world's still coming. Things aren't as they should be, but Jesus is coming back and he's going to fix it forever. Expect imposters. Expect political and natural disasters. Number three, expect persecution with global advance. Persecution with global advance. Look with me again at verses 9 through 13. 
Jesus says, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before me. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brothers will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I want you to realize that everything we just read in that paragraph reads like a perfect prediction of how the book of Acts in the Bible plays out. It's like we just read the story of the book of Acts. As you read the book of Acts, you see that the earliest Christians were arrested. They were beaten and even killed. They did stand trial before both Jewish authorities and Roman authorities. The Holy Spirit did give them just the right courageous words at just the right time to bear witness to their Christ. The gospel did spread everywhere. In a general sense, it was proclaimed to all nations, just like it says there in verse 10. But what's most remar remarkable in the story of the book of Acts is the gospel, that the gospel spread not in spite of persecution. No, the gospel spread because of persecution. Isn't that interesting? I mean, think about it for just a second. Do you remember what caused the earliest Christians to spread out from Jerusalem and take the gospel everywhere? Well, it was persecution, wasn't it? That caused them to spread out. How is it that the Apostle Paul had opportunity to bear witness to Christ, not only before the Jewish authorities, but also before governor after governor after governor, on his way all the way to Rome, where he presumably bore witness before Caesar himself? How was all of that possible? It was possible because the Apostle Paul was falsely accused and on trial, going from place to place in handcuffs, as it were. You see, in the book of Acts, persecution and gospel advance are related and this is the case in Jesus' prediction here. He told us it would be so. This has been the case down through the ages, ever since Jesus predicted it. As Tertullian once put it, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Persecution often fuels gospel advance. We should expect it. There's lots of examples of it in history, but I often think of the young missionary Jim Elliott and his four missionary colleagues who in 1956 were speared and macheted to death on the beaches of Ecuador as they tried to reach the Wadani people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was as a result of their tragic death that others were inspired, including Elizabeth Elliot, to go back to that people group and to reach them with the gospel. And hear me, thousands of other young people were inspired to give their life to the cause of evangelism and global missions because Jim Elliott and his colleagues died on that beach that day. Or we could think of modern examples today. Uh, this is uh, low-hanging fruit, but we think of China, where the government oppression there is mounting, and yet at the same time, the underground church is spreading, growing, multiplying. Persecution and gospel advance often are related. And Jesus says we should expect as much. So let's bring this concept home to our day, to our church, to our society, to our lives. Christ Community Church, Jesus is saying here that it's in those very places where the gospel is most opposed that we should expect to see the greatest doors opening for our witness to his name. Who in your life, who's that colleague, that friend, or that family member who most ridicules your faith? It may be, it just may be that that's the very person who is most ripe for the gospel. <laughs> that, that may be the most important ready-made opportunity for you to bear witness right there with that person. See, we've got to get our expectations right, don't we? Jesus says, expect imposters, expect political and natural disasters, expect persecution with gospel advance. But notice next, number four. He says, we must expect the abomination of desolation. Expect the abomination of desolation there in verses 14 through 23. 
Now you're thinking to yourself, welcome back, Pastor Eric. Hope you had a great sabbatical. We got a great text for you to preach your first Sunday back. <laughs> nice and easy. The abomination of desolation. Wow, look, this is the most difficult of Jesus' predictions in our passage. I'm sure you would agree. So let's see what we can discover here. Jesus mentions it there in verse 14. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, etc., etc., etc. What's this all about? Well, the phrase abomination of desolation actually comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel, where the prophet Daniel predicts that in the future there will come a wicked king who will come and greatly persecute God's people, and then he will defile God's temple by performing an abominable act leading to desolation and destruction. So we could translate the phrase, an abomination that causes desolation. That comes from Daniel. Well, here's the thing. That prediction in Daniel was fulfilled in the year 168 B.C. 168 B.C. When the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes cracked down on the Jewish people, forbid their customs, burned their scriptures, marched on Jerusalem, set up an altar to Zeus in the temple, and sacrificed a pig on the altar. This was an abomination of desolation, as predicted in Daniel. And as many of you know, this led to the famous Maccabean revolt, in which the Jews end up winning back their independence and autonomy for a time. Okay, well, here in Mark 13, Jesus picks up on this original prophecy in Daniel, as well as its fulfillment in Antiochus IV. And then Jesus looks forward and predicts another abomination of desolation that's still coming. You follow? So Jesus is like, when you see it happen again, Flee. Run. Run to the mountains. Don't go back into your house. Don't go back to get your coat. Pity women who are pregnant in that day. May it not happen in winter. Run. And so here we get back to the disciples' initial question, don't we? Remember what they had asked Jesus. They said, when will these things, namely the destruction of the temple, when will these things take place? What sign should we look for that the temple is about to be destroyed? And Jesus says here that the sign that they should look for is the abomination of desolation. And here's what I want you to see, brothers and sisters. All of these things, this abomination of desolation, actually happened right according to Jesus' prediction in our text in Mark 13. In 70 A.D., the Roman Emperor Titus would launch a gruesome five-month siege on Jerusalem. Eventually, he would enter the temple. The Roman soldiers would put up their standards and offer sacrifices in the temple precinct, and all would eventually be destroyed. It was, yet again, an abomination causing desolation. It happened in 70 A.D. And yet, here's the tricky thing. Here's where all the debate comes in. Because what Jesus describes here in Mark 13 and his prediction here seems even greater than what happened to Jerusalem and temple in 70 AD, doesn't it? The, 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 the level of persecution, the level of trial, the, 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 the magnitude of all seems even greater than what happened in 70 AD. So if you look with me again at verse 19, remember what Jesus says there. In those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now look, Josephus tells us that the siege on Jerusalem was, in fact, brutal. The Romans crucified so many Jews, they ran out of wood. The people inside of the city walls faced so much horror. There was infighting, there was murder, starvation, disease, even cannibalism. So it was horrible stuff. And yet, Jesus seems to be describing something in this 
prophecy that is even greater than those days, even greater than what happened in 70 AD and the suffering there. And so it would seem that not only is Jesus in Mark 13 predicting the fall of the temple, but also Jesus seems to be predicting an even greater period of suffering carried out by an even more ultimate anti-Christ figure who will set himself up as the abomination of desolation. Very likely it's the same figure that the Apostle Paul mentions in 2 Thessalonians, someone that Paul calls the man of lawlessness. Let me show you what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians up on the screens. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, various verses, he says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So, putting this all together, it seems clear from the teaching of Jesus, coupled together with the teaching of Paul, that before the very end, this man of lawlessness will arise, some antichrist type figure who will set himself up as a god. He will demand ultimate allegiance. He will demand ultimate worship. He will carry out unprecedented persecution against God's people. And this man will, in fact, be vanquished by the returning Christ. Praise be to God. Now, Christians debate the details, as you know. You can have that debate today over lunch. But the rough sketch seems clear, doesn't it? Jesus is predicting something here, and he says to expect it. I wonder, does that kind of scare you, brothers and sisters? Does it kind of make you feel unsettled and unnerved, this thought of, of this amped-up persecution under the hand of this sort of ultimate antichrist evil kind of figure? Does all of that disturb you or rattle you? If so, I want you to remember the ray of hope that Jesus puts right in here, there in verse 20. Look again. Look straight at it. Verse 20. He says, if the Lord had not cast, sh cut short the days, no human would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Are you one of God's elect? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ and therefore you know for sure you're one of God's elect? Then you've been chosen by God the Father. You have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. You've been sealed by the indwelling Holy Spirit and God's sovereign hand is upon you. Therefore, Satan can't touch this, right? So if in God's mysterious providence you are still alive when all of this goes down, you can rest assured, brothers and sisters, you're going to make it because you are held in the sovereign hands of our God who preserves every, each and every one of his true people. Expect tribulation, yes, but also expect the faithfulness and preserving power of our God. Jesus says, expect imposters. Jesus says, expect political and natural disasters. Expect persecution with gospel advance. Even expect the abomination of desolation. But finally, I want you to see one more point. He says, expect the glories, excuse me, expect the glorious yet unpredictable return of Christ. Expect the glorious yet unpredictable Return of Christ, verses 24 through 37. Now look, brothers and sisters, I know we've gone long, but listen, I've been on sabbatical for eight straight weeks. I'm going to give you more than your money's worth this morning. we got one more point. Are you with me? Here we go. Look in these verses. On the one hand, Jesus said we should expect, we should anticipate, long for, and find great hope in the fact that his return is going to be cosmic. Drawing on language from Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man comes on the clouds over to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and he receives this kingdom that will never pass away. And, and drawing from language in Isaiah and others of the prophets who describe the final day as this sort of 
astronomical cataclysm, drawing on all that Old Testament language, Jesus says this in verse 24. In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Listen, this description in this text leaves absolutely no room for any theory that would say Jesus' return is merely spiritual, or Jesus' return is merely symbolic, or, or, or merely metaphorical. No, no. Jesus says here, this is no science fiction, my friends. Jesus assures us that he is coming back visibly in real history with unrivaled authority and unrivaled power. He will gather his people. He will vanquish his enemies. He will judge and he will save and he will make all things new. This is the glorious, awesome, triumphant, resplendent return of Christ the King. And this is the great hope of the Christian faith. Brothers and sisters, this is your great hope this morning. This is your great hope this morning. If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you are trusting in him, if he has made you right with God forever through his work on the cross, then this is the king you're waiting for and this is the new world that he will bring. And it should shape your life. You should expect it. It's going to be big. You ain't going to miss it. But if you don't know Jesus, if you don't trust him, if you haven't done business with him, I urge you today, today is the day, bow your knee to him so that on that final day, you can greet him with joy too. We should expect the return of Jesus to be glorious, as it says here, and yet at the very same time, hang with me, at the very same time, Jesus' return is also unpredictable. It's glorious, but it's also unpredictable. Even though we have these signs that Jesus has told us about, things that keep us alert, even though we have all of that, no one actually knows the day or the hour. In verse 28, Jesus uses the example of a fig tree which loses its leaves in winter, but when you see those leaves begin to bud, you know that summer is almost here. And in the same way, these signs remind us that Jesus is coming soon, but yet it's at a time that we cannot guess. It's a time that we cannot predict. In fact, Jesus tells the disciples that their generation of people will see all the signs mentioned here, at least in part. They will see all the signs before the end is here. Look again at verse 30. Did you notice it? Jesus says in verse 30, Truly I say to you, this generation, the generation of the disciples, will not pass away until all these things take place. So come to think about it. The disciples' generation, they did witness false messiahs, didn't they? They did witness wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and arrest and persecution and the spread of the gospel to the nations. And they even witnessed the abomination of Titus leading to the destruction of the temple. They see all of that. They saw all those signs. And yet, they still have no firm date on which Jesus would return. Not even Jesus himself knew the date of his return. Isn't that wild? As a human, he willingly set aside use of his omniscience and lived in dependence upon the Father, and only the Father knows the date. That's what he says there in verse 32. But concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when that time will come. Jesus didn't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father knows. And if any self-proclaimed prophet on TV tells you they've cracked the Bible code and they know the exact day that Jesus is going to return, that person is a liar and a fool. Change the channel. No, we Christians have to be comfortable with the fact that Jesus' return, though glorious, is unpredictable. And so as Jesus puts it in verses 34 through 37, the end of our passage... We need to live life like a doorkeeper. His master put him in charge of the door, watched the door, and the master went away. And Jesus says, stay awake through all the four watches of the night because you don't know at what time the master is coming back. So keep, alert, keep awake, stay alert, be faithful. That's the message. Here's one concluding thought. 
Have you ever wondered why God didn't tell us the exact date of Jesus' return? Uh, we could speculate, but I'll tell you my theory. I think it's because we would get so lazy right up until the last second, and then we would suddenly get fanatic. <laughs> Come on, you know it. If you knew for sure Jesus is coming back in just a few weeks and you knew a specific date, a specific time, what would you do? You'd go berserk, you'd sell all your stuff, you'd buy a fancy sandals vacation somewhere, <laughs> go out to a beach and just wait it out. Here's the thing. Jesus isn't interested in our fanaticism. But hear me, he is interested in our faithfulness. And so in God's goodness, he has not told us the date. But he has told us, stay awake. Be watchful. Be faithful. Wait. Be expected. Well, as I'm sure we've seen today, I'm sure you would agree. Jesus has some great expectations for us as his church as we navigate the time between his first coming and his final coming. The question is, do our expectations align with his expectations? Do ours align with his? Brothers and sisters, my final word to you this morning is, don't be disillusioned. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged by all the chaos in the world and opposition that we seem to face. No, Jesus told us about all this. He said, these are just labor pains. The good news is the new world's on its way. And King Jesus is bringing it with him. So let's live every day faithfully with great expectations.